All right, I assume the cut in music means that it's time for me to start. So first of all, welcome. This is uh, CMP406, Amazon ECS at Coursera, powering a unified uh, general purpose execution microservice while defending against untrusted code. Now this is a 400 level session, so we will assume familiarity with Docker, with Linux, and with Amazon ECS. Um, we hope you take away from this session a number of techniques for a near line uh, scheduled and batch microservice powered by Amazon ECS. Additionally, we will be discussing a number of security vulnerabilities and countermeasures when running untrusted code within Docker and on Amazon ECS. And so we hope you learn some of the defenses that you can apply in your own usage of Docker. Finally, we'll talk about why we have actually forked the Amazon ECS agent and modified it and why you may want to as well. Now this talk is organized as follows. Begin by introducing Coursera to provide the necessary background to understand the decisions that we've made and why we've done what we've done. Then we will move into, uh, my colleague Frank will actually discuss our unified uh, job execution framework, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of using Amazon ECS, and finally go over our system's architecture. Then I'm going to delve into one application of this uh, unified scheduling and uh, execution system, and that is evaluating programming assignments. And in particular, we'll discuss the security threat model involved, and finally, go over the attacks and defenses that we employ to secure our system. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to begin by introducing Coursera. So Coursera uh, was founded in 2012 by two Stanford professors, and our mission is universal access to the world's best education. We partner with world-class educational institutions from around the globe. We have a couple of them up here behind me. Now, these institutions, they take their best programs, their best instructors, and their best courses, and they put them on the Coursera Global Learning Platform for anyone to consume around the world. Now, we have a couple of the course icons behind me here, and these courses actually span a range from highly technical courses, including machine learning and our data science specialization, to humanities courses, including learning how to learn, social psychology, and irrational behavior, to name a few of our most popular. Now, Coursera is all about education at scale. This is inherent to our mission. We have 15 million learners worldwide, well over 1,000 courses, and well over 100, uh, over 100 partners. Now, our scale brings a number of opportunities, but also a number of challenges. For example, the export gradebook function is relatively trivial if your courses have 20 or even 200 students. Our courses regularly have over 200,000 participants. Now, in order to meet our global learning platform needs, we've had to develop a number of techniques, systems, and tools in order to help power and make this all work smoothly. And now, I'd like to turn it over to Frank Chen, a founding engineer at Coursera, to discuss our unified execution framework. Thank you, Brennan. So what does a unified execution framework entail? So three things, batch processing, scheduled processing, and nearline processing. And I'll go over each of them in turn. So what does batch processing enable us to do? As Brennan said, instructors, by putting in return for putting courses on our platforms, one of the things instructors want from us are reports. Great exports, learner demographics, and course progress statistics are just three examples. Generating these reports is easy for you know, 20 or 200 learners. It's very hard for 200,000 learners. We can't do that in five seconds, so we have, to batch, we have to batch process them. Similarly, our finance, business development, and marketing teams want, bis want very up-to-date business metrics, and our payments team wants to do, say, payments reconciliation to make sure that we are getting the right product to the right people. So this is, and this, uh, and again, this is very easy when you have, you know, a thousand learners. It's very hard when you have a hundred thousand learners or a million learners, for instance. So the second thing is scheduled processing. So how many of you have received a Coursera recommendation email before? Great. <laughs> so that is, part, that is actually being sent out as a batch job that's run every week that sends out a recommend, weekly recommendation email to each of our 15 million learners. And uh, at the same time, we also do smaller, uh, schedule, scholar, smaller marketing emails involving uh, targeted marketing and some and user reactivation. And finally, nearline processing enables us to do pedagogical innovations. So Coursera, at its heart, is an education company. And we develop things like, for instance, peer review or auto-graded auto programming assignments 
to help with that. And nearline processing enables us to do some of these things. As an aside, I just want to talk a bit about what is peer review. So in a lot of our classes, such as uh, fiction writing or modern poetry, instructors cannot accurately assess student performance just by asking MCQ questions. Y you want students are required to submit, for instance, uh, short answers or essays or even submit drawings or recordings. And you really need human beings to evaluate these. In an ideal world, you know, you can, we can hire you know, 1,000 TAs to grade these submissions, but we can't afford that. So you can, but we can do the next best thing, which is getting other students to evaluate your work. As part of this system, we need to assign reviewers to your assignments in a fair and, and efficient manner according to sometimes complex criteria, and near-line processing enables us to do this. And Brennan later will talk about uh, programming assignments. So again, before I jump into what we did with ECS, I want to talk about the early days of batch processing at Coursera. We built two systems back in the early days. First was this system called Cascade. It was a PHP-based job runner, and you can imagine how well that worked out for us. It originally ran in screen sessions, and it pulled APIs for new jobs. So PHP really is designed for serving WordPress sites and so on. It's really not designed to run for hours at a time. So we had a lot of unexplained memory leaks that forced us to write a Python script that restarted the PHP scripts once in a while <laughs> because of these memory leaks. And this and made it really fragile and really unreliable, and our developers were not very happy. And as we moved from a PHP and Python-based backend to, uh, to a Scala-based backend, uh, we also rewrote this thing called Saturn, which is a Scala uh, scheduled batch job runner. It's based on the Quartz uh, scheduler library. So this was better than Cascade. For one, it has types. But then all jobs ran on the same JVM, which you know, cost a lot of interference. For instance, a lot of our metrics reports uh, starts uh, every hour at the top of the hour, and when you have 15 of these jobs starting at once on the same JVM, reports would take 20 or 30 times longer than they should be, and again, this caused developers to be really, really unhappy. So we were looking for something better, and, we, and what did we want? We wanted six things. One, our new system had to be reliable. So Saturn and Cascade were really flaky, and developers became, became very frustrated with jobs not running properly. Second, we wanted something that's easy to de develop for. So developing and testing locally with those old systems was very difficult, and developers, unfortunately, developed the bad habit of pushing code to prod without testing it. So we wanted something that required little to no setup and little to no boilerplate code to actually write and test the job. Third, we wanted something that's easy to, de easy to deploy. Again, deployment on those two old systems was very difficult and fragile. What we did was that we killed off the old processes on, the, on, on those machines and Git pulled and just restarted the jobs. And as you can imagine, that killed off a lot of running jobs. So that was not great. And besides that, we also had very good tooling for our online deployment services. And our product engineers were, were asking the infrastructure team you know, you have these great tools for online services, actually written by Brennan, but you know, why can't you do that for your offline services? And so we need to come up with an answer for that. Fourth, we wanted something with high efficiency, specifically low startup and shutdown overhead. We wanted to be responsive enough to start a job within, say, 15 seconds and 15 seconds of a job being requested, and this is really important for, especially for near-line processing requirements. Fifth, we wanted something with a low ops load. So Coursera, despite you know, being over you know, 180 people, has exactly one DevOps engineer. So he can't possibly manage everything. And besides that, Coursera has a tradition of developers owning their own services. And developers really don't want to be woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning because their jobs died. And finally, cost effectiveness. We are startup and we are cost conscious. And in our research, we found that most of our jobs actually complete in about 15 to 20 minutes. So we didn't want to say run a new EC2 instance for every single job that comes up because EC2 uh, rounds cost up to a full hour. So we wanted something that's cost effective. And we looked at a couple of other technologies. So we are developers. We want to write our own code. And sometimes we have a, we have a not invented here syndrome. So we tried. We tried that, but it proved to be unreliable. Specifically, it proved to be difficult to handle coordination and synchronization across you know, a cluster of machines. 
Next, we look at Apache Mesos. So Mesos is a general scheduling framework uh, by the Apache Foundation. So it's very powerful, but on the other hand, it's very hard to productionize properly. And, this, and me, to run Mesos properly, you need developers with experience, and we didn't have any experience at that time. And finally, we looked at uh, Kubernetes by Google. So this is, a, again, another scheduling framework, this time by Google. So uh, at least at the time we looked at it, it was really designed for the Google Compute Engine uh, first and everything else second. And second, it was not a managed service. So that created a higher ops load uh, for our poor DevOps engineer. And then during, re during reInvent last year, uh, Dr. Werner Vogels introduced the Amazon EC2 container service. And we looked at it and was like, yeah, this might be exactly what we want. So why is that? So three things. First, low maintenance. Amazon, in this case, does the hard work of coordination and synchronization in a distributed system, and even provides an agent to run the jobs itself. So this makes our DevOps engineer very happy, because he can have one AMI with Docker and that agent on it, and he can launch, say, 16 instances of it, and suddenly has a 16 machine cluster in which to run jobs. So that's great. Second, it's integrated with the rest of AWS. For instance, we can use AWS IAM roles and users to, re to restrict access to the ECS API. And this makes Brennan, who is also our security engineer, very happy because we got security without him doing any extra work. <laughs> and finally, it's easy to develop for. Amazon traditionally has a very good set of APIs. Uh, documentation and SDKs and ECS is, of course, no different. So we found it very easy to grasp the key concepts and get started with using Amazon ECS. And this made me very happy because I ended up being the guy who wrote all the code. <laughs> um, so Amazon ECS is a great building block, but we still need to build tools around it for our purposes. So what did we build? So you might have seen this, seen the name Iguazu in the keynote given by uh, Dr. Ver Dr. Vogels in the morning. So what is Iguazu? So Iguazu is a batch job scheduler for Amazon ECS. It has three modes. Either you can run a job immediately or you can run a job uh, in a deferred manner. For instance, run a job two hours from now, or run a job at 9 PM tomorrow. Or you can run it in a scheduled recurring or cron-like manner. Say, run a job, say, at 2 PM, Mondays through Thursdays every week. It's programmatically accessible internally via our standard APIs and clients. And it's named for Iguazu Falls. It's the world's largest waterfall by volume. And we hope that Iguazu was, will handle a similar volume of jobs. So let me go through the architecture of Iguazu. Uh, with like a sample request. So in this case, a user submits a request to a front end or online service. For instance, an, ins an instructor might be requesting for an export of all the grades of the learners in his class for a specific quiz. And so he submits a request to the quiz service. Uh, the quiz service detects that, okay, this is a bad shot, and it just makes a request to Iguazu front end. Iguazu front, the Iguazu front end persists pertinent job information to Cassandra, which we use for our database. And the front end then submits the job request into an SQS queue. And the Iguazu back end then reads the pending jobs off the SQS queue and processes them. So in this case, it will talk to the ECS APIs to get a list of all the container instances and select the container instance manually to run a job. So a special note here. In our original design, we handed off the scheduling part of this to the ECS system itself by calling run task. Some of you might be familiar with that. Which would run, which would randomly choose an instance with enough CPU and RAM, CPU and RAM uh, resources to run my job on. Uh, however, we found that this was not flexible enough for our purposes. Specifically, as we were integrating the Iguazu backend uh, with the EC2 auto scaling system, we, uh, in order to auto scale our EC2 uh, ECS uh, container instances, we found that run task would sometimes schedule jobs on instances that were in the process of termination. So that's not great. So we decided to switch to the start task API and wrote our own scheduling, very simple scheduling system instead. So with that, we eliminated the problem by you know, just simply not scheduling jobs on instances undergoing termination. Uh, in addition, Iguazu also has the capability to receive notifications from the lifecycle APIs uh, when, say, an instance is getting terminated. And Iguazu will, will even block the termination of, his, of instances uh, until all jobs that were already running on those instances uh, had completed. So this greatly, re greatly improved uh, reliability, especially when operating with auto-scaling. 
And of course, if the jobs cannot be run because of, say, a lack of resources available, then they will just go back in SQS queue uh, for retry after a 10 minute waiting period. And if the job, of course, still fails to be scheduled after an hour because, say, a developer accidentally requested for 64 gigs of RAM, then the job will just be deleted and an exception logged. And, if have, and of course, if we have successfully identified an instance with enough resources, then we would call the start task API and ask ECS to run the task on a specific container instance. The Iguazu backend will also periodically monitor the job by calling the ECS APIs and update the status of the job in Cassandra. And, of, and each online service, in this case the quiz service, can query the Iguazu front end for that job update in, within Cassandra. And of course, similarly, developers can use an admin interface to schedule recurring jobs. So this goes into an alternate Iguazu front end that basically wakes up every second to, and sends all the, all the jobs it has to run to the back end via the same queue. So that's great. So how do, we, how do developers develop Iguazu jobs? So because we write everything in Scala, we wanted to make it as simple as possible. So all developers really have to do is to write basically a new class called job, specify the amount of CPU, uh, CPU for the job, the amount of memory for the job, and just one function run, and Iguazu will handle the rest. So this is almost, there's no, almost no boilerplate code and it's very easy to get started. And running jobs from other services is even simpler. So we have an internal REST RPC framework called NapTime that abstracts the details of uh, inter-service API calls away from developers. So developers can just take the uh, Iguazu client uh, that NapTime provides and call the create method with the parameters, in this case, uh, ex exporting quiz grades, and, the, and just call it, and, the develop, and, and there you go. Uh, you, get a, you get a new job instance running just like that. So it's really simple. And you know, the developer and ops user, so we have a develop, we have a admin interface uh, like I talked about, and you can say add scheduled jobs, look at all the invocation, look at all the job invocations that are happening, and things like that. And you can just you know, click the plus button in the lower right to add a new scheduled job, and they also can click to edit existing ones. And of course, all changes are logged for auditing purposes. Deploying jobs also becomes very easy. So for developers now, they just merge into master, and that's it. Uh, and Jenkins take o takes over. Jenkins first builds a zip package from master, prepares the Docker image with the zip file, pushes the image into, the, into our own Docker I registry, which we are going to switch to using the newly announced EC2 container registry, and registers the updated jobs with the Amazon ECS API. So this makes life really easy for developers from developing the jobs, to running the jobs, to deploying the jobs. So sometimes things go wrong, or even when things go right, we want to look at logs and metrics. So we did something really simple here. Uh, so logs are just stored, for all Docker containers, logs are just stored in warlib Docker containers, and we just upload this into uh, a log analysis service. We use Sumo Logic, you might use Splunk or any of the other providers, or even roll your own. So one of the problems with this is that container IDs are specific to that Docker, uh, to, to that Docker process, and it's not apparent you know, what container ID is associated with which job. So this, the simplest solution we can think of and we implemented is that we just print out the job name and the job ID at the start so that people can search, uh, people can search for their specific job very easily. And we find that this works pretty well in practice. And same thing with metrics. Uh, again, we use a third-party metrics collector called Datadog, and we submit metrics for both jobs and the container instances itself. And we found that so long as you know, worker machines can talk to the internet, things will work out pretty well. So we launched this system in April of 2015, and currently we have 65 jobs running in production, uh, we have 44 different scheduled jobs, and we have over 1,000 uh, runs per day on the main system. So developers are definitely happier with this system than with the previous PHP-based ones, but we are always continuing to improve the system. And now I will hand it back to Brennan, our information security officer, who will talk about a special case of Iguazu, which is evaluating programming assignments. Brennan. Thank you, Frank. So, what do we mean when we say evaluating programming assignments? Now, some of you may have uh, done programming assignments when you were in school. On the Coursera platform, they look as follows. Pro pro programming assignments start with a set of instructions and typically some starter code, this uh, blue link here. 
This is actually from a course in Chinese on uh, competitive programming in C. Now, uh, participants in the course download that starter code and work on the assignment on their local machines. And when they've got things working, then they upload them, their submission, back to the Coursera platform. Here is our web uploader interface. Immediately upon uploading the submission, we kick off a job to score that submission. We want to provide instant feedback as much or as close to that as possible for pedagogical reasons. Now, these test cases, they're not Coursera authored. An instructional team will put together a suite of typically test cases and sometimes even static analysis tools like Java Find Bugs and package it up into a Docker container and upload it to the Coursera servers. We then schedule this to run on Iguazu. Now, program Coursera, I previously mentioned, Coursera is all about education at scale. And this scale actually manifests itself in multiple dimensions. Not only must we contend with hundreds of thousands of participants in some of our largest courses, but we also must scale across course topics. In particular, we cannot target, for example, the JVM. We cannot target uh, Node and JavaScript. We have to handle a whole broad range of different courses. We have courses from programming for everybody in Python to courses that use the GPU programming uh, framework from NVIDIA CUDA. Fundamentally, the greatest common denominator for us is we have to be able to handle running and securely running arbitrary binaries. So this is the security challenge that programming assignments presented to us. Now, actually, by, by a show of hands, who would like to compile and run arbitrary C code from random people on the internet on your own machines? <laughs> you all are AWS employees, I can tell. <laughs> the thing is, we don't even require a credit card. Anyway, we've had programming assignments. We've had programming assignments on Coursera since roughly the beginning, since 2012. And our first generation system looked as follows. Learners would upload their submissions to the Coursera servers, and they'd immediately be put into a queue, Amazon SQS. Graders, authored by the instructional teams, would pull an API, download the submissions, evaluate them, and post back a score to be included in the, uh, their, their grade, um, people's grade for the, for the course. Now, typically, the way this worked is we would provision an EC2 instance or two in a separate AWS account and let the instructional teams you know, log in and set up everything over there. Some of our more advanced or adventurous uh, instructional teams set up their own infrastructure. Some of them even set up in their own AWS account auto-scaling on spot instances, and others even used alternate cloud platforms, including Google App Engine. And of course, some professors set up their graders on machines under their desks. Naturally, the power cord always became unplugged hours before the submission deadline. Now, this first system had a couple of weaknesses. In particular, it didn't have auto-scaling uh, except for the few instructional teams that set it up. Now, when I was in school, I confessed to being a bit of a procrastinator. I never turned in assignments more than two days before the deadline. And as it turns out, procrastination is a global phenomenon. We, <laughs> after running this for, for an extended period of time, we would regularly see submission spikes of over an order of magnitude more compared to just simply the, the day before. So typically what would happen is we would over-provision for the weeks coming up to the assignment deadline. We would then be woefully under-provisioned for the few hours before the submission deadline, and so we'd frantically add capacity. And then, naturally, we'd forget about all that added capacity for a week or two later, and it would just sit idle, wasting money. So this was a bit of a problem. Further, in this first-generation system, we ended up punting on securing the code to basically the instructional teams. And securing untrusted code is hard, and so this was met with mixed results. Finally, the last thing we learned is that grade, evaluating programming assignments, grading, is surprisingly challenging. Things fail in unexpected ways. And I think this is best illustrated by an example. Now, we had a course on parallel programming in Java. And so the task was to solve some problem within a set amount of CPU time. So what the grader did is it would have some test case, and it would start the submission on that particular test case. And it would then monitor the amount of CPU time it used. And either the submission would complete the task and would be done, or it would use too much CPU time, and the grader would kill it, and uh, it would respond back with a grading failure. Now, this, these graders worked beautifully until someone submitted an assignment that had a deadlock in it. In fact, it deadlocked every single time it ran. Now, for fault-tolerant purposes, 
if we don't hear a grade ping back from the, in the instructor grader within 15 minutes, we re-add it back to the queue. And so that way, you know, if an instance died or something, you know, we'd be able to, to handle it gracefully. Now, some of you may have figured this out, but basically what happened is the grader would download this uh, submission, it would start it executing, and then watch CPU time very, very carefully. Now, because it immediately deadlocked, CPU time never increased. So naturally, 15 minutes later, Coursera, we put the submission back in the SQS queue, and another worker in their grader ended up pulling down and getting stuck as well. This is just one example of a large number of strange edge cases that show up when you're really trying to run untrusted code. It's sort of a wild world out there. Now, Coursera recently underwent a complete revamp of the course platform. We've migrated from running courses two to three times a year to starting a new session every two to four weeks. Um, and as a result, as part of that, we've had to completely rewrite from the, effectively from the ground up our course platform. And in doing so, we actually got another shot at having better programming assignments infrastructure. Now, Coursera is a startup, and be, we also provide generous financial aid. And so we are actually very cost conscious. And in many of our reviews of our cost spend, we found that these programming assignment graders were a disproportionate amount of our, our EC2 and, and AWS costs. Since it's a given that we need to support more courses with more interactive and sophisticated programming assignments and other kinds of assignments, we needed, we were targeting cost savings of an order of magnitude for our second generation system. Now, to us, cost savings implied auto scaling, and that works really, really well. It also helps with the load spikes. But this also implied to us we must use a shared pool of resources. No longer can we dedicate a whole EC2 instance to an assignment or even to a whole course. Now, we have had a lot of experience with these other previous graders, and we found that, again, this, they took a disproportionate amount of our ops load. They, on both the Coursera side as well as on the instructional team side, things would break, disk would fill up, a new version came out, things would need to be patched. We could not handle this sort of ops load as we were going for, as we we're going forward scaling our course platform. Now, no maintenance to us. We've had a huge amount of success with very little maintenance and ops load for our online serving stack, and we use the, the immutable Im infrastructure and blue-green design patterns for deployment. And so we wanted to try and apply those same learnings to our programming assignments infrastructure. Now, the final, uh, or the third uh, design goal that we had is we wanted to provide feedback in near real time. For pedagogical reasons, it's far better to receive your feedback on your submission as soon as possible after the submission so you can learn from it and continue to improve. And so we wanted to actually execute fast graders and turn around a grade within 30 seconds at the 90th percentile. Now, near real time means that we have no hope of booting an EC2 instance on every new submission, not only because uh, it would waste a lot of money, but also because they can't boot fast enough. And so in combination with all of these, the previous uh, two design goals, these three design goals imply that we needed to use containers and Docker. Finally, we wanted to bake security right into the infrastructure without, and this would allow us to automatically relieve a number of uh, security vulnerabilities from the instructor graders. And this actually had the added benefit of making the whole system more robust to more innocent occurrences. But what does secure infrastructure even mean? In order to understand that, we had to define a threat model. What can submissions do? What can't they do? And in particular, we wanted to prevent submitted code from doing the following. We wanted to prevent submission A from at all changing or affecting the score from submission B, from the evaluation of submission B. This is a pretty reasonable design goal um, and would definitely make our students happier. We additionally wanted to prevent a submission from being able to disrupt or take out the grading environment. And we also wanted to really, really, really make sure that a bad submission can't take out the rest of our course platform. Now, these graders provided by the instructional teams, they typically have secret test cases. And so we also, by default, wanted to make it as difficult as possible to steal those test cases. Now, it's it, it, we can't make it impossible to steal those test cases for a variety of reasons, but we wanted to make it as difficult as possible. And finally, we wanted to prevent this you know, super submission from always changing its score to 100% every single time. We wanted to try and make it as difficult as possible for submissions to do that. 
Now, as part of our threat model, we made a number of assumptions. As previously mentioned, due to our scale in terms of the breadth of courses, we had to handle arbitrary binaries. Further, instructors are humans, and therefore they make mistakes. And because of that, we assume that instructor grading scripts and the instructor containers may have security vulnerabilities. This has the implication that all of the grading code and everything within those containers we treat as untrusted. Finally, although the Linux namespace implementation has been around for a few years, Docker is still a relatively new process, and so we assume that there are unknown vulnerabilities within the container implementation as of today. This assumption is also uh, bolstered by the fact that the Docker website itself says this should not be trusted for containing uh, un un untrusted code. Now, this last assumption ends up bifurcating the threats and vulnerabilities into two main categories. In particular, the first one, we assume that the basic container technology is secure. And given that, we want to prevent any negative impacts to running this arbitrary code. The second category is, of course, we assume the opposite. We assume that basic container technology is vulnerable. And given that, we want to mitigate the impacts as much as possible. So with that security context in mind, let me describe the system that we built. So we built a service and architecture for grading programming assignments called GRID. And it builds on top of Amazon ECS and Iguazu exactly. Now, I named it for Tron's Digital Frontier, but it has a convenient backronym, Grading Inside Docker. Now, the way it works is learners upload their submission to the GRID servers. And the GRID servers immediately turn around and persist the submission in an Amazon S3 bucket. Upon completion, Grid invokes Iguazu to schedule the execution of the grading container uh, through the ECS APIs. It, these containers then get scheduled on these highly secured and hardened grading machines. Now, with that basic architecture overview, I'd like to delve into some attacks and defenses, starting from some very simple ones and moving to more serious ones. Now, a very simple one is a simple resource exhaustion attack. A submission could try and eat up as much CPU as it can. It can try and eat up all of memory on the machine. It could even try and eat up all of the swap space on a machine. So fortunately, the Linux kernel has control groups, and, and Docker provides a really nice API to, to set them. Um, these C groups, um, as they're affectionately known, allow you to set CPU quotas and limits on memory and, and swap. And it's important to get both of those because the memory limits will not also protect against swap overflows. Further, we have a hard timeout for, cont for container execution, and this ensures that some runaway process, even if it's using within its quota, can't continue to uh, uh, flood the, the system with uh, uh, useless CPU work. Now, another shared resource is the file system. And it's important to protect against runaway submissions or even uh, innocent submissions from filling up disk. Now, we use ButterFS. And the reason for that is because this allows us to set quotas on a per subvolume basis. And because the, we can map a, sim, a single subvolume into a particular container, this allows us to limit the total file system usage by a single grading container submission to a set fixed amount. Another part that you have to be wary of is you have to uh, throttle IOPS, or to make sure that they're being shared evenly, because that's another resource. If one submission is pounding the, the disk, they can end up taking up all of the IOPS and disk bandwidth. Now, there's another shared resource, the kernel. And there are a number of attacks possible that a malicious submission can do to try and attack and take out the Linux kernel to take out or take it, gain advantage in some way. For example, a submission can try and open as many files as it uh, can. Fortunately, Linux has U-limits, which allows you to set a number of limits. In fact, we can do this on a per C group or per container basis, and this is the no file or the uh, number of open file limit. And this works really, really well. Another attack is a fork bomb attack, or a process could try and spawn as many sub-processes as possible and try and consume a lot of memory, both in user space as well as in kernel space. Now, the Linux kernel has the nproc process limit, but note that the nproc process limit is enforced on a per user basis. And because all of the grading containers run as the same deprivileged user, this actually has some unfortunate implications for us in that one grading container could fork too many times and impact the score of an alternate one. Now, the way you can handle it is by limiting the amount of kernel memory on a per C group basis. 
And this basically will prevent a process from forking too many times because there won't be enough space in the process table in kernel memory to continue forking, and the fork will fail. Now, unfortunately, this works pretty well, but it still leaks a little bit of memory. And so as a result, we have a hard limit on the total amount of execution time, and this gives us a complete defense. The final shared resource I'd like to discuss is network attacks. Now, there are a number of attacks that are possible if a submission has access to the network. In particular, they could just be a Bitcoin miner that just tries to mine Bitcoin as much as possible on our uh, dime. They could try and poke at uh, AWS APIs and, and Amazon S3, which would also be unfortunate. And finally, they could even take our grading instances and launch denial of service attacks on Coursera or even other third party sites on the internet. And this was obviously not appropriate. So we, the conclusion we came to is that we needed to deny all network access. And this has the added benefit of meaning that we can actually regrade assignments at a later point without being beholden to particular services or something being online at a particular time. Everything is contained within the container, which is kind of nice. Now, in order to deny network access, we had to modify the Amazon ECS agent. It's not, up until this morning, is not possible to specify the network mode and, and disable network access for containers launched by Amazon ECS. We initially started, Docker has a number of ways of limiting network access. In particular, it has the network disabled flag, which denies all uh, network, all access to the TCP IP stack, among other things. This unfortunately is too restrictive for us. For example, we have courses like a Ruby on Rails course or a web development course where they need to run a local web server to run tests and to evaluate the submissions. So this did not work for us. This feature is also deprecated according to the Docker uh, documentation, so we wanted to move off of that uh, in order to enable all the courses we need to support. Now, Docker has the da when you run Docker run, it has the dash dash net is equal to, and there are a number of potential network modes, and the one that works for us is net is equal to none. So what happens is Docker creates an independent network stack for each container, and because it's not linked to the actual network, it's not bridged to the host, bridged mode is the default mode, this allows us to get complete isolation, in particular binding to local host or ETH0, or the loopback device within each of the containers, is totally separate, and so the loopback device in one container is separate from the loopback device in another container, and this gives us complete resource isolation. Now, I mentioned to do this, we've had to fork the Amazon ECS agent. We have it available open source on GitHub. Feel free to check it out or send us pull requests. Now, I'd like to move on and discuss the second category of attacks, and that is we assume here that the namespace or the container implementation has unknown vulnerabilities. How do we defend against that? Now, containers are not the only security game in town with the Linux kernel. In fact, it's one of the newest ones. There have been many other older ones. A good, good oldie is discretionary access control, or the typical Unix file system permissions. Be sure to set those correctly. But another one I wanted to talk about is there are mandatory access control systems built into the Linux kernel. Now, there are a couple different variants of this, AppArmor and SE Linux, and the one you should choose depends upon the Linux distribution you are using. Because we use Ubuntu, AppArmor is our mandatory access control system of choice. Now, up until this morning, in order to set an AppArmor profile or to set this, the limits uh, a particular container can do, we had to modify the Amazon, e Amazon ECS agent. Fortunately, as of now, if you would like to set a Mac uh, uh, an AppArmor profile on your containers, you can do this now without modifying the Amazon ECS agent. What does AppArmor allow us to do? It allows us to deny access to key parts of the file system. It allows us to audit certain resources and even deny other capabilities. So it's an extra great layer on top of con the container security. Now, there's another security feature in Linux, and that is uh, POSIX capabilities. And it used to be that Either you had root or you were a peon, uh, and you, that was basically the only differentiation. Uh, capabilities in the Linux allow you to disaggregate all the reasons why you might need root. You might need root to bind to a port below 1024. You might need root in order to change the owners of certain files. Capabilities allow you to, in a more fine-grained fashion, allocate what you can and can't do instead of it's just root or not. Now, we can actually drop capabilities within the containers so that even if you do get root within a container, 
you can't access certain capabilities that are dropped. And so we're able to do this, and this adds another layer of defense to limit the amount of nasty that a malicious submission can do. Finally, we do our best to deny root within the container. And in order to discuss how we do that, because we can't trust the base container OS itself, we need to actually, uh, in order to prevent root escalations within the container, we actually have to modify the instructor-provided container images. In particular, we pull apart the uploaded container images uh, into the, from the Docker bundled uh, format, and we scan through the file system and do a number of checks and make a number of changes. In particular, we clear the set UID bit from all binaries. And this is the typical way that you escalate to root. And if you just can't do that within these grading containers, then that adds another major layer of security onto our grading platform. We do a number of other checks, and one of them that we do is we insert a C wrapper that does uh, a statically linked C binary that uh, does a number of additional security checks at runtime when the containers are launched. Now, in order to do this, we needed a you know, job execution environment that worked in near real time. And so as it turns out, we had one of those with Iguazu. So our grid cluster is actually two Iguazu clusters, one for the grading cluster that runs everything in a very secured mode, and one where we actually clean the uploaded Docker images before registering them in the grading cluster. Now, in order to pull apart, reassemble, and register the Docker uh, grading images, we actually run Docker inside of Docker. In order to do this, we actually have to run. It's, it's supported by Docker, um, mostly. And uh, in order to do this, you have to run the container that runs Docker inside of Docker with a privileged flag. Um, and in order to do this, we actually had to modify the Amazon ECS agent again. So we actually have two forks. One is the secured grading fork, and one is our privileged mode fork that allows us to run Docker and Docker. Now, I've discussed a number of attacks that allow us to secure things on a host-level basis. But it's important when you're really trying to do security to have defense in depth or have multiple layers of security. So we have an additional layer or a number of additional layers of security at the network level. So all of this runs within Amazon VPC. And this allows us to deny public internet access to our grading machine. So we, you just can't talk to the internet when you're on one of these grading machines. Additionally, we use Amazon security groups to restrict network access, inbound, outbound traffic between the instances and, and, and elsewhere on the network. And finally, Amazon VPC allows us to turn on network flow logs, which allow us to see if there's any strange network activity going on within our cluster that we can then investigate. Finally, on top of all of this, we run this all entirely in a separate AWS account. And this gives us a whole bunch of peace of mind that no matter what happens in this grading account, the rest of our Coursera learning platform should survive unscathed. Finally, what happens if someone does break out of the container system, escalates to root somehow, and, and has taken over the box? Well, because everything runs in an auto-scaling group, we just go through and regularly terminate all of the instances that have been running for a while. So even if you do manage to break through all the layers of security, you still only get the instance for a couple hours before you're gone. And this is really nice, a great peace of mind. Now, we have a number of other security measures that are important. If we're going to uh, run something securely, we need monitoring and auditing. So we use CloudTrail and a third-party uh, security monitoring agent from ThreatStack that looks for any unusual activity on these instances, files changed, processes running. And most importantly, because this is an entirely automated environment, if there's anyone who logs in, if there's any TTY, that's an immediate alert. So how do we actually guarantee that everything is secure, that we haven't just uh, pretended to be secure? We pay a third-party red team, Synac, to try and penetrate this environment. And so far, so good. Now, some of you may have noticed we have a major problem. And that is we've locked down these grading containers so much that we can't even get the score out at the end after it runs. <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. So the way we actually solve this is we have a co-process that runs outside of the containers and mounts a shared file system. And the shared file system is used for communication. So the grades are put on the shared file system and then shipped back to the rest of the Coursera Learning Platform and the other AWS account and persisted for uh, display and analytics purposes. Now, this system has actually worked really, really well for us. We have thousands of assignments evaluated daily. We have um, near 100 assignments on the platform and dozens of courses using this programming assignments infrastructure. But despite the success, there are a number of improvements that we'd like to make. In particular, 
sometimes instructors make mistakes in their graders, and they need to regrade all previous submissions. So we'd like to add priority queues so we can use the same shared cluster without impacting new submissions as they come in. We'd like to add better instructor tooling, and the second one that I'd like to talk about is that we'd like to more have a more accurate simulation of our production environment on their local machines. And in, in order to do that, we can't simulate the AWS network um, security layers, but what we can do is we can open source our AppArmor profile. So we may try and do that in the near future. Finally, I talked about that CUDA class, but unfortunately, we still don't have the capability of mapping the GPU devices into our grading containers. So we're hoping to get that working soon. Now, building this, we've learned a number of lessons. Not only should you always run the latest kernels and, uh, for the security patches and, and updates, but as it turns out, there are a number of important usability and feature bug fixes that happen in the newer kernels. In fact, ButterFS can get so full, you can't delete any files on it. It gets wedged because it's a copy on write file system. The default, and, and most importantly, the default Ubuntu 14.04 kernel is not new enough, and it's still vulnerable to this bug. Further, it's important to carefully monitor disk usage. In our typical online serving environment, you add a bit of log rotate, and you auto scale instances, and you basically don't have to worry about disk, at least in our, in our case. Docker is not the same, and it ends up using a lot more disk, so you need to be, have careful monitoring uh, systems in place. Additionally, reliable deployment tooling is a must. We found this in our online serving stack, and it, the same is true for this environment. By having everything reliable and automated, we can reliably and with confidence push new changes and security patches out to this cluster. Finally, building a platform for code execution is much harder than building an API in front of a database. And so I'd like to give a big thank you to all the engineers at AWS who are building the secure and reliable systems we have come to depend upon. Now, I'm almost done. We have a couple of related sessions. We have uh, also from Coursera tomorrow. You can learn about how we power our learning analytics and our instructor dashboards. And actually, in the next session, the next time slot, uh, there's Amazon EC2 container service distributed applications at scale. And I hear that's supposed to be good. Now, if anything of what we've talked about today sounds interesting to you, please know that Coursera is always hiring uh, phenomenal engineers, developers, and uh, designers, and managers. And please uh, you know, reach out to us if you'd like to join the team, and also follow our tech blog, uh, where you can learn about some of the stuff that we're up to. So thank you all very much for attending. <laughs>